I'm Emily McCabe, and this is Fishing Game Changers, brought to you by Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. In this series, I join our staff in the field to learn more about what they do, why they love it, and what drives them to apply their time and talent to the Maine outdoors. I've recently discovered how much I enjoy observing and identifying birds in my own backyard and have been very interested to learn more about how I can do a better job of protecting and enhancing important habitat for wildlife in and around my own property. To get more information, I reached out to my coworker, wildlife biologist Adrian Leppold. She shared some great information with me about how we can all make small changes in our own backyards that can have a positive impact on some of our declining species of birds. Adrian has been working as part of the team at Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for over seven years and is a non-game species specialist based out of our offices in Bangor. I'm the state songbird specialist those birds are kind of lumped into a category called passerines and that encompasses more than half of the birds that occur in North America and in Maine. Full disclosure, I'm not a Mainer. I am originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I've been working in ornithology, the study of birds, for well over 20 years. And what brought me to Maine was working with the Maine Coastal Islands Wildlife Refuge System, managing some of the offshore islands for their seabird colonies. My first time to Maine was 2005, and I was just immediately hooked. I just fell in love with Maine, with the people, the culture, and the atmosphere, and the birds, and the environment. And then I started looking into graduate school options. And so I officially started at UMaine in Orno in I moved here January 1st, 2008, and I, through a master's and then a doctoral program at UMaine, I was at the university for the better part of seven to eight years, and so I obviously made a lot of connections with other professionals in the state, and so was working closely with people in the agency, and when my predecessor decided to retire, it just seemed like a good fit, and I knew I wanted to stay in Maine, so. Meant to be. Sort of. Not long after Adrienne began working at the department, she dove right in and started putting together plans to conduct a breeding bird atlas, which is a large-scale effort to survey and census a given regional area for all species of breeding birds. I immediately started putting together a proposal to fund um, a project that we soon named the Maine Bird Atlas, and we actually just completed the data collection portion. But all of this started the summer of 2016, and we put together a steering committee and had lots of organizational meetings well before the official launch, which was in 2018. And the goal of this project, at its simplest level, was to replicate an effort similarly done in the late 70s to early 80s of a breeding bird atlas. At the time Adrian stepped into her role as the songbird specialist, it had been 35 years since Maine's last breeding bird atlas had been conducted. So Maine was long overdue for an updated comprehensive assessment and building of a current knowledge base for birds in Maine. And we just expanded it to also include a winter period, which had never been done before for the state. We just completed the five-year data collection period for the Maine Bird Atlas, and it was largely a citizen science project, so it really helped us engage with people. When it was all said and done, over 6,000 volunteers contributed to this project, which is amazing to me. It exceeded my wildest dreams. I was like, if we get half of that, I would have been thrilled And I'm just, like, beside myself (laughs) that we had that many people engaged with this project. So of all those people that participated and helped collect data for the project, obviously some of those people are very experienced birders and already had that built into um, maybe something they consider a hobby or part of their lifestyle. But you also brought in a lot of people who were not very experienced. So could you just talk a little bit about kind of the magic that happened there and, and how... The, the project really connected people who just happen yeah. to look out their window and yep. see birds. That's a great word for it, because I feel like it was magical in a lot of respects. And, you know, we just capitalized on the fact that birds are one of the most conspicuous things in nature that people often 
relate to and connect to, or at least enjoy at its simplest level. Even people that don't consider themselves birders, at least in the state of Maine, you're probably familiar with the chickadee. And most people know more birds than they think they do. And a, a big part of this project was also reaching those people and encouraging them to know that what they see matters and what they pay attention to is valuable information. And also the goal, a big, you know, one of the four main objectives for this, the first three, yes, that's centered around collecting data about the abundance and distribution of breeding and wintering birds in the state and what kind of habitats they were using. But the fourth main objective was just for this project to provide a platform for people to connect with nature on a deeper level. And it's really hard for change to happen with things that you don't care about. But once you start connecting to something more, it's hard not to care more. And so that was the hope, a big hope of this project with that outreach component. And the cool thing about the Atlas was that you know, it's, it wasn't just asking people to tell us what they saw, but it was asking people to tell us what they saw the birds doing. And so it was sort of asking people to play detective and you have to pay a little closer attention to bird activity. And again, when you're watching the birds enough where you start to see them bringing nesting material to a bush right outside your back door and then holy cow, these things are feeding their babies every 20 minutes. It's insane the amount of energy that goes into just producing an animal that provides us with, you know, the beautiful songs that we hear and the beautiful ducks on the water that we enjoy watching and, you know, sporting and consuming. And, and so you have that deeper appreciation. And so it's hard not to care when you see things impacting them in a negative way. So in order to make the changes to improve and conserve our resources, we wanted people to just pay a little closer attention and connect with them, the nature and birds around them. And it worked. It worked. All those people participated and, and really helped you achieve the data collection. Um, so let's talk about what, you know, to kind of keep the energy around that moving forward and, and continuing to connect people to even what they see in their backyard or for a short walk in the woods. What are some of the things that you would love people to know more about birds in their own yard, in their backyard, and how they could help enhance that and provide a better place for those birds to thrive? And what are some of the the things that you, you think or see people do inadvertently on knowing that they're affecting, you know, the species? Like, what are some of the things that are causing a problem? I think the first thing for people to know is that declines are real. And they're becoming so stark, I think, that I'm hearing more and more just from the casual backyard bird watcher. That they're just like, gosh, I just don't have the birds that I used to at my feeders. What's happening? From a researcher perspective, we've been studying these declines for decades. I mean, the cause of declines and this phenomenon of bird loss, you know, we've been researching, well, I mean, people have been researching birds for hundreds of years, but we've been really starting to document this loss back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And I think it's becoming so much more apparent. And there was a very poignant research paper that came out at the end of 2019 and it started this movement around three billion birds and so in the last 45 years we have lost three billion birds in north america so basically one in every four birds has disappeared and then when you you know really narrow that down and look into specific species groups some are more alarming than others and some have actually increased um our raptors and waterfowl, for the most part, are kind of the success stories of conservation efforts over the last 40 years. But a lot of the other groups of birds are in the category of severe, alarming declines. And so the simplest answer when people say, well, what's causing the decline? It's habitat loss. But I think that concept is kind of too big for most people to relate to. Sure, habitat, and you think of big, massive, large tracts of land, clear cutting and rainforests and strip malls and things. There are actually four components that define habitat for any living organism. It's food, water, shelter, and space to reproduce. And so if you eliminate any one of those four, that's habitat loss. And so 
our presence on the landscape, whether we're doing some big massive project or just how we are maintaining our own property has an impact and everything's a balance. We are sharing space and occupying this planet as well. It's fair for us to have our yards and hiking trails and ski resorts and whatever. But then, you know, how can we balance the impact that we're having to the best of our ability? And one of the biggest things is creating habitat in your own landscape or property. And so I have less than a quarter of an acre in residential Bangor where I live, but I am maximizing that to the best of my ability with pollinator gardens and my own fruit and vegetable gardens and the tree species that I'm choosing to plant. And when you focus on planting native things and even not mowing my lawn until June so that early season insects have an opportunity to forage on clover and dandelion and you know just changing that perspective that those things aren't invasive ugly weeds you know they are really beneficial plants that help support insects that help support birds and everything else around us and there's a lot of great resources if you are interested in learning how to improve your you know, landscape for wildlife. Maine Audubon has great resources available. Um, I would recommend people check out the Wild Seed Project in Maine as well. And they will tell you because then the next obvious question is, well, how do I know what the right thing to plant is? And so those are great resources that you can go check out to really help improve your habitat for wildlife. Adrian certainly practices what she preaches. She shared with me a change she has made when it comes to maintaining her own backyard at her home in Bangor. I made a choice, you know, the whole no mow may phenomenon that's in play now. Most people are getting more familiar with hearing that term, but I think it's still, especially in cities, you know, there are city ordinances to keep things kept up. And I actually went to City Hall and kudos to Bangor for producing signs for us to put in our yards, both from an outreach perspective, but I think for their benefit too, maybe helps cut down on the phone calls from neighbors complaining that, you know, people's yards are looking terrible and overgrown. So I had a great little sign in my yard that said, no mo may, help the pollinators. And I was the only one on my street that did. But I think it's going to take time to shift from that mindset. Change is hard. Change takes time. But we just need to shift that mindset of where, oh, that's that looks awful. Don't you want a nice mown lawn to kind of maybe now, can we start looking at people who mow their lawns and going, oh, you mowed your lawn? Oh, all the bees, darn. So what are some things that people should think about or know or understand when it comes to feeding birds? Um, different seasons where that maybe is a different recommendation, different methods that are used, any um, consequences that they're unaware of that feeding can can cause. Is feeding birds the solution to fixing (laughs) the decline? That's probably one of the biggest questions that I've heard around feeding birds is, are they are they dependent on it? Am I helping? The easiest, simplest answer is no, not really. A feeding birds is something that started for our benefit. It's something to bring the birds closer to us so we can see and enjoy them more. Are they using the feeders? Absolutely. You know, is it make or break life or death situation for them? No. And oftentimes when people see birds not at their feeders, they automatically question, oh, where did they all go? And it's usually just an indication that the birds prefer natural foods. And so when natural foods are abundant around us, that's going to be their default. The feeders is kind of a backup. That being said, in extreme, extreme weather events that we have in Maine, you know, in other parts of the state where birds are adapted to their environmental conditions and weather conditions. If you have a really intensive long cold snap, if we are below freezing for two weeks, or even like single digits below zero for a week or two on end, then the feeders can absolutely be a make or break situation and are kind of good life support for birds. But for the most part, it's supplemental feed. The biggest thing that people need to know with feeding birds, and again, for the most part, we're doing it for our benefit. So know that going into it, you're doing it for your benefit. And so I don't 
expect that if you're doing it for your benefit to enjoy birds, you want to do harm. <laughs> like most people want to think that they're helping or at least being neutral. The biggest thing with feeders, it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. You cannot put a feeder out there and just keep filling it indefinitely and like, oh, we're good. Oh, whatever. Um, and so that's the biggest thing. I myself have gone through periods of time where I don't have feeders up because at my property, because I know I don't have the capacity and time to commit to maintaining them in a way that's healthy for the birds. If you are not taking your feeders down at least four times a year, once a season, and thoroughly cleaning them with a dilute bleach solution, you should not have feeders out, period. You know, if there are weather events and seed is just sitting in there molding, you need to clean it out more frequently. Or if you notice sick birds coming to your feeder, you need to take everything down and clean it out. And it's not just the feeders, it's the ground around it because all of that feed and that we have ground feeding birds. And so a lot of people, you know, seed that falls off the feeders, it's great because then you have it. That's a way to attract a diverse set of individuals. It is important to point out that putting bird feeders in your yard can often attract other species of wildlife to your property that might not be welcome. In those cases, removing bird feeders and cleaning up any bird seed that's on the ground will deter those unwanted visitors. You can learn more about living with wildlife by visiting mefishwildlife.com slash livingwithwildlife. There are some better ways to attract birds to your property without the use of bird feeders. Changing up your landscaping to include species of native plants is a great place to start. A lot of people don't understand why having native plants is so important, and especially for our insects and other wildlife that eat those insects, birds being a primary one or other insects. Native plantings better support those insects because as we're doing ornamental plantings, the insects that thrive in Maine have not evolved or developed with those plants. And so most organisms have some kind of specialized diet or needs. And so at the energetic level, those ornamental plantings don't offer the nutritional value that the insects need and then supplementally what birds would be attracted to. So anything that is going to produce and support more insect life is going to be beneficial for birds. Seems counterintuitive. Maybe you don't want to attract more insects to your property. But I think that's, again, where education comes in and like people understanding the beneficial value of insects and not thinking of it just as, you know, oh, we need to spray for ticks, mosquitoes, and black flies. But there's a lot of other classes of insects that are really valuable and that even eat those pest insects that we don't want or are not desirable. And so when you create this essential habitat, then everything kind of balances itself out naturally. And so then we don't have to resort to extreme measures like spraying for unwanted insect pests. And I think that's what, you know, it's just a matter of educating how all of those pieces interconnect and how to have a healthy functioning ecosystem and the role that we play in providing those important connecting pieces. And, you know, there's lots of research and lots of study that show for example, birds on migration, and particularly in the fall, a lot of our insect eating species start shifting to a more fruit-based diet. And when they look at the energetic composition, for example, of like a native honeysuckle versus our invasive Japanese honeysuckles, the actual fat content and sugar cooked calories in the berries is so much less. And so our birds are eating these invasive berries and filling up on them, but they're not getting the nutritional value out of it to carry out these hundreds, thousands of miles flights that they need to do to migrate between here and their southern wintering grounds. If you're interested in learning more about native plant species that you can use on your own property, you can check out a great resource that is offered by Maine Audubon by visiting mainnativeplants.org. Although the Maine Bird Atlas has been a large portion of Adrian's focus over the past few years, 
She also stays busy with a number of other responsibilities in her role as the state's songbird specialist. A big part of all of the species specialist roles for the agency is research and management. And so while the Alice has been going on and directing that, and I have a wonderful team of colleagues and uh, partners that have helped see this project through Maine Natural History Observatory, Maine Audubon, and Biodiversity Research Institute. Colleagues with those entities have been the core staff for the Atlas Project and have been key in helping keep this thing moving forward because I do have other responsibilities with the state that range from contributing information for environmental review projects, for management of state-owned wildlife management area properties and how we're going to oversee managing for different wildlife or how to acquire different lands, working with colleagues in academia who are doing very specific targeted research projects. There's been a number of grad students over the last couple years that I've worked with their advisors on projects specifically related to forest management practices is a huge portion of Maine is managed by timber industry, balancing meeting bird needs and the needs of that industry. And kind of bringing those two pieces together has been a big focus of work. I've been helping and supporting and writing grants to fund a program run through the Somerset County Soil Water Conservation District called Ag Allies. The purpose of this, getting back to that three billion birds, the declines of grassland birds across North America are the most stark. They're the highest group of birds that have been over 50% loss of all grassland birds. And so this program and others like it in sister states is targeted to work with, because again, most of our native grasslands and prairies have been converted for agricultural use. And so how do we balance meeting farmers' needs and the needs of producing food for all of us with the birds and providing the benefits that the birds offer as well, primarily in the form of pest management in these fields. And so this Ag Allies program is working with landowners and it's expanded around the state. It started in Somerset County, but now um, there are over a hundred farms and landowners and just keeps growing and growing. And so that's something that we're pulling in IFNW staff now to help support where you know we're trying to balance the biggest thing is early season mowing these birds are ground nesting birds and they occur and really love the same high productivity hay sites that are great forage for our cattle and horses in the state Um, and so just balancing meeting the needs of the farmers in mowing and keeping their livelihood afloat while still trying to kind of not have a complete loss of all bird life from the fields. And so for landowners that can like give a little portion of a field to the birds, this project is going out and identifying, okay, this is the highest concentration of birds. If we can leave this until a July 15th date or potentially earlier, if we can go out and clear once the nests have completed and fledged and delay that mowing. And that goes for landowners that just mow for lawns as well. Like our grassland birds can utilize anything even as small as like two to three acres they will occupy. It's been really rewarding being part of this on the ground now because you get to go out and talk with these landowners. And the first year or two of the program, Ag Allies has a certain amount in the budget to offer incentives to the farmers or landowners to delay that mowing. But even just after a year or two doing this to benefit the birds, they're already seeing the value of it. And they don't need that incentive anymore because they're noticing the how it's translating into their own productivity right. of the rest of their fields as well. And so, again, just kind of making that mindset shift and helping them for a few years to see like, no, this really does work. And it's, it's good for you in the long run, too. In addition to supporting programs like Ag Allies, Adrian has also been working to get protections in place for Maine's most vulnerable species of birds. 
I do want to highlight the legislation just passed to update the Maine Endangered Species Act. And so that that's another part of my responsibilities with the state and other species specialists is to just stay aware of the status of species that we're responsible for and identify for listing purposes if they need additional protections. And so five of the eight species that were added to the Maine Endangered Species Act this past legislative session were ones I'm responsible for and did worksheets on to push through. And, you know, examples of kind of that citizen science contribution and atlas data at work, I utilized a lot of that data in assessing the status of those species and saying, whoa, red flags, these guys are in trouble. And if we're not doing something about it, we're going to lose them in the next 50 years from Maine. Thanks for listening in and learning more about the work being done to conserve and protect birds in Maine. You can learn more about Maine's Bird Atlas by visiting maine.gov slash birdatlas. We hope this week's episode has increased your awareness and concern for our declining species of birds in North America. You can learn more about the ways you can help make a difference by visiting 3billionbirds.org. Join me again next week as I chat with another member of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife team and explore what it is that makes them a game changer. In the meantime, be sure to hit subscribe on your favorite listening app. And if that app happens to be Apple Podcasts, then take a moment to leave us a review and let us know what you think.